Um, I just wanted to follow up on the uh, question that was asked to Dr. Wells earlier. Am I live? Yes. <laughs> uh, and that is in <clears throat> about the mechanism of uh, uh, that would be consistent with intelligent design. Uh, many, many religious thinkers and philosophers have said God, who you know, who had a, a theistic view, have said God, in fact, created the world, created laws, created reality as we know it, nature, uh, by thinking it, that, that God, God uh, had a thought, let there be a world, let, it, let there be light, and there was. Uh, that Now, it, regardless of the details and in the absence of any detailed theory, which you've reasonably said you don't have it would that uh, is that kind of a uh, uh, pattern of causal explanation one that is amenable to scientific test in any way and if if not um, is there some other explanation of how anything like a, a, a conception of God as a spiritual being and uh, beyond nature would causally interact with a natural world. Uh, I certainly don't have an answer for that, uh, but let me emphasize that when intelligent design looks at evidence in the natural world and sees patterns, as Michael said, uh, the, the end point of the inference is this object, this feature, appears to be design. I mean really design, not just an illusion. Uh, how it was designed and by whom are additional questions which are fascinating and significant, but the evidence for the design inference does not get us there. Uh, now, I think there are fruitful ways to apply design in my field, cell and developmental biology. Uh, I'm in fact doing that uh, presently, and I do it by, uh, from within a design framework, uh, I, I see what, what appears to be design. I assume then as a working hypothesis that something is designed, and I try to understand it from that perspective. And I do think uh, that design theories presently are uh, achieving insights, and I predict future breakthroughs. This is a promissory note, of course, uh, from this perspective. Uh, but at this point, it's a fledgling enterprise, and I can't present you with any dramatic results. Uh, well, David Kelly has asked, uh, you do epistemology, right? You're the D David Kelly, yes. So you've asked the, the question, I mean, where the rubber meets the road. At some point, if you believe there was some form of uh, supernatural intervention into our space and time, the finger has to come in and stir up the particles in some way to direct it or something, whatever it's supposedly going to do. And at that moment, it's legitimate for us to ask, how did, how did he do it? What forces did he use? I mean, is he using electromagnetism or gravity or some other force we don't know about yet, uh, natural selection? What, what forces did God, whatever, using? That's a legitimate scientific question. So when we saw, for example, this business about intercessory prayer and, uh, and, the, and the experimental group supposedly getting better from their heart surgeries than the control group because they were prayed for, uh, this is a, a, an epistemological question. C can my uh, uh, prayers to the deity cause him to in, go right into the OR and tweak the cells in the heart or the plaque in the arteries or something better than the, the guys who didn't get uh, prayed for. And the results were null. In fact, the, the group that was prayed for, that were told that they were prayed for, actually did slightly worse, which, <laughs> which is rather telling. But, but really, it, it, that, that is the question that makes people nervous, because if you want to ask the question from a scientific perspective, it's perfectly legitimate for us to ask, how did it happen? What forces? And how, can we measure it? Can we test it? That's, that's what we do. It's a legitimate question, but my point was that it's not a question within intelligent design theory. Intelligent design theory merely seeks to identify patterns that have the hallmarks of real design as opposed to illusory design. Sigrid. Hi, I'm Sigrid Fry Revere. I work here at Cato. I have a very practical question for you, for both of you actually, and it was based on experience I had with my children and a nanny we had who believed in intelligent design. Um, she would tell my son every time he asked a question, because God made it so, all right? 
it was killing his curiosity. You'd ask him, why is it rain? Because God made it so. Why is the flower red? Because God made it so. Why should the child continue to ask questions about anything? So I fired her. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did the right thing. <laughs> That's the free market at work. <laughs> Can I comment on that? Uh, well, I think that was a bad answer, too, but that's not what intelligent design says. Uh, I would say the counterpart to that, which I've often heard being used with children, is evolution did it, which to me is no better than saying God did it. Either one is a curiosity stopper. Right here. Uh, hi, Ken Green, American Enterprise Institute. Um, I was also trained in the sciences, but I mostly study policy, so I want to ask a very specific policy question uh, to Dr. Wells. What exactly is it you wish to have changed in terms of the teaching of evolution? Do you wish either any disputed theory in a public school to not be taught or all points of view to be taught? And is it only in science or also in theology? So should every class on religion inc include an equally rigorous course in atheism? Well, uh, as I briefly uh, said in my uh, remarks here a minute ago, uh, I do think Darwinian evolution should be taught in science classes. I think it should be taught honestly with a full uh, acknowledgement of the problems it's, it has with the evidence. Uh, and it has many. I mean, I've just mentioned a few here. Uh, I do not think it should be eliminated at this point, although I think the gentleman over here had a legitimate point that uh, it often, in fact, carries a lot of atheistic baggage that does not belong in the public schools. Uh, I would love to see the public schools uh, turned into private schools myself. I think uh, with Mr. Shermer that would alleviate many of the problems here. But in the meantime, I think Darwinism should be taught, but it should be taught critically rather than as a doctrine that cannot be questioned. I think uh, another interesting point related to also the textbook writer uh, earlier, how does anything make it into the science curriculum, for that matter? And I mentioned Lynn Margulis, who's a, a microbiologist and professor at, um, at UMass Amherst. And uh, so she has this theory of symbiogenesis, in which the complex eukaryote cells that you and I are made out of uh, were once, uh, the little organelles in there were once themselves prokaryote cells, much simpler cells. This is why mitochondria has its own DNA, for example, which is really weird if you think about it, until you think about it in her theory. Anyway, Lynn's been, uh, she's been working on this theory for 40 years, and it was very controversial for many decades. And uh, she set up a lab, she got grants, she got graduate students, she did research, she published peer-reviewed papers, monographs, technical books, textbooks, popular books, going to conferences, popular speeches, and finally, after about 30 35 years, it's now just trickling down into the biological curriculum as a largely accepted but still mildly controversial theory about the origins of complex cells. So the answer is you do what Lynn did. You roll up your sleeves and get to work and collect as much data and test hypotheses and go to conferences and so on. And that's how it's done and that's how anybody does it. There's no czar that says you cannot introduce supernatural explanations and nobody allows it. There's nobody doing that. It's just, it's just science is this sort of collective enterprise in which you got to, it's a sort of a free market. So you got to get out there and sell your uh, and convince your colleagues that you're right. And in fact, intelligent design theorists are doing that. Intelligent design as a, an organized body of theory is only a little over a decade old. So give us another 30 years and we'll be there too. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going to